Hey everyone, it's Laura here at What's It Feel Like? And I am coming to you live with Luca. Luca, say hi to everybody. Hi, how are you guys? Luca is 16, correct? Correct, correct. yeah, I'm 16. And Luca was on NBC Nightly News a couple nights ago talking about vaping and his experience with it, his addiction to it actually that led him to rehab. And I um, reached out to him and said, I found him you know, online and I said, would you be willing to come talk? He said, Let, talk to my mom, which was very smart of you, Luca. And we arranged it and he's here this morning to talk about his experience with vaping, which so many people across this country, it's on the news every day, people are dying, they're having massive um, illnesses with their lungs. And so we really wanted to talk about what it feels like to vape, why kids do it, even adults, and why it's so addicting, and what it feels like to to stop, which was clearly not easy for you, Luca. So yeah. start off by introducing yourself and what how your experience started with vaping, what life was like before vaping. Yeah, so I, my name is Luca Kiner. Uh, when I was in eighth grade is when I first started using tobacco products. It was... Uh, the summer before ninth grade, kind of just getting out of eighth. So I was in that in-between stage, and I was using chewing tobacco, cigarettes, and cigars. Uh, I wasn't really that much of a fan of them. It was more of just a way to fit in. Um, but it wasn't until my freshman year of high school, my first night football game, when I was really introduced to vaping or juuling, as it was. And it was just a way to fit in. I was at a Friday night football game in one of those front row seats. I wanted the best ones with older kids. And that was my token to get in. So I was doing that for a while. Um, can, can I interrupt you about the fitting in thing? Were you not mm. comfortable saying, did you want to really try it? Or were you just like, well, everybody else is doing it, so I guess I will? I really didn't have like a no or a yes kind of going on. It was just because, you know, previously I'd already been using cigarettes and chewing tobacco. So I was just kind of like, well, I'm already using nicotine anyway, so this isn't, this isn't that bad. Um, when in reality, it, it very much was. Okay. So you started it, and what can you explain to people, because we talked about this before we hit live, that a lot of people will think, oh, vaping, so it's like a water vapor. And it's just, mm -hmm. you know, but really what it is is an aerosol shooting mm -hmm. the nicotine straight into your lungs. Absolutely. So That's tell it. me what, explain to me how it works for you when you actually use, because some people don't really know what juuling or vaping is. Yeah, so for vaping and, and juuling, uh, there's a different type of nicotine solution within it. It's called salt-based uh, nicotine, and it's just a smoother hit. It's but it's right there in front of you. Um, they purposely made it so that when it goes down, it's not as harsh, so you're getting more in, um, so you're not as drawn away from it, um, which also makes it more appealing, which just feeds into your addiction. And so you try it, and then tell me what starts happening to you physically and mentally over the coming months. Yeah. So I used to be a straight-A student. Uh, I quickly went to failing. I used to do, play two sports. As soon as I started, I quit. Uh, I used to do Boy Scouts, and my, my attendance in Boy Scouts quickly declined. But it wasn't about till a month in when I was like, okay, this is not just a way to fit in. I'm already fitting in. All this is is just going to be a stress reliever. I was so dependent on it. Uh, you know, as a teenager, you have so many things going on and things thrown at us. So every single thing that was being thrown at me, I use as a reason to validate my addiction. And so why did your grades, why did you quit sports? Why did your grades go down? Because people might say, yeah. just because you were vaping, I don't get it. My focus had completely changed. My focus was so fixed on, let me get this fixed. Let me get this head rush. Let me stop being stressed. So it quickly became that I didn't care about the other things. I, our person was, my excuse then was, I don't have time. When I had all the time in the world, uh, I just wasn't making enough time for it. I was making time for other things. How easy was it to get? It was super easy. So it was one of three ways. You know, you're in high school, you're with people who are legally able to get it. So I would just say, hey, will you get this for me, like five extra bucks? Or just stand out at a gas station or a smoke shop and say, some random stranger have maybe five to extra bucks. Right now, at least in my area, I could honestly just walk into a vape shop or some gas stations and not even be ID'd. Wow. And so, take me, so you start You start getting out of sports, you, you, you're not really, your grades are failing. When did the addiction get like, okay, this is not good. We've got some serious problems here. Yeah, so the whole time it was pretty bad. So, I mean, obviously I told you about the failing of the school and all the, all the other things I was missing out on opportunities, but my relationship with my family and friends was really, really toxic. I was very irritable. I was always aggravated. So I was very hostile, um, very volatile with all my friends and family, but especially at home because I live with them. 
Especially what? Because I live with them. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> so, yeah, we definitely clashed guys quite a bit. But and it it, because your focus was on whenever you weren't vaping, you were focusing on when you could get that next release for your brain. Exactly. And then I felt like anything that was being said to me was just wasting my time or making it more difficult for me to get. So I just get more frustrated with myself or anyone else, honestly. And so your parents um, tried to reach out to doctors and try to get help. And finally, about what, 15, 16 months into you starting vaping, they decide you've got to go to rehab. Yeah. And the reason they decided to go to rehab was a collection of things. So throughout my addiction, they had been sending me to one-on-one -on -one therapist, psychiatrist, even got me checked for ADHD. Um, but it wasn't until September of 2018 when I had a seizure that we believe is linked to vaping. Um, there's no definitive answer that it was linked to vaping or that it wasn't. Simply just because the doctor said there's no research, we can't rule it in, we can't rule it out. Um, but because of all the other cases we've seen and we've heard of, we definitely believe it was linked to it. And it was not just a seizure. Wasn't it a grand mal seizure, which is like yeah. a massively dangerous seizure? Yeah, I had a six-minute grand mal seizure. Uh, I've never had any experience with that ever. It was the only time I ever had it. So it was definitely very, uh, it was definitely very scary. It was definitely an outlier uh, type, of, type of thing. And that's what I saw it as. I didn't see it as, okay, well, this just happened. I just had a seizure and just died. It was more of, well, this happened. Like, life continues. So I had no, I had no regards uh, for my life. I had no value for it. So for people that think, you know, well, you, I know that cigarettes have an addiction, you know, yeah. withdrawals with that. Your withdrawals were very intense in rehab. Is that correct? Yeah, they were definitely very intense. I had a lot of anxiety. Uh, and I was very tense all over, especially my back. So my back constantly hurt. I had nausea, insomnia, um, and oftentimes I had cold sweats occasionally as well. I was very shaky. What can you tell me a little bit more about what rehab felt like to you and your yeah. mindset going in, and then how it felt as you started getting further along in your your withdrawals? Yeah, so the mindset going in was just every single emotion imaginable. It was mostly anger, um, definitely a lot of fear because my parents told me the night before I was going, so I hopped on the plane. Um, early in the morning and I went there. So there's definitely a lot of emotions going in. But while I was there the first two weeks, I was just kind of immersed with the idea that I was in California and not North Carolina anymore. Um, it was definitely very surreal. It was very hard to wrap my head around. Mm -hmm. so sometimes I'd forget where I was and I was just like, well, this is just a home so I can walk wherever I want. And that's not the case in rehab. You're very restricted in what you can and can't do. Um, there's constantly people watching you. There's certain things you can't use in there, like they don't have forks. So, um, oh, yeah, it's very restricting. It was very restricting. It was very lonely as well. Or did anybody say to you, "You're in here for a vaping"? So, you're not actually. So the counselors there are not supposed to tell them, just because of the HIPAA law. But if you were to share it with them personally, so I used to like. I never had a problem with it. It was just, I used to like drink occasionally. I just told them I'm in here for alcohol just because I had simply drinking like once or twice. So, yeah. You know, it was, um, I didn't tell them I was there for nicotine. And if I did tell them I was there for nicotine, I was like, this is so absurd. Like, this is so stupid. I want my here. And they were like, yeah, like, this is the weird way to get out of here. Like, your parents are odd too. So, what was, was, your, what was your mindset when you got out, Luca? How hmm? you feel when you got out? Oh, gosh. Yeah. Um, when I got out, it was very overwhelming. You know, life for you in there stops, but life for everybody else outside continues. So there was a lot of information I was definitely missing out on, especially being in high school. So when I got out, I was just overwhelmed with this influx of, of people telling me this information that I didn't know about. Uh, it was very overwhelming, very scary. Like what kind of information? I mean, just what was what had been happening since you'd been Yeah, gone? exactly. Um, well, so when I went, I didn't tell people. I told three people. And the three people I told didn't know I was going to be gone for that long. So when I got back, people were like, where'd you go? Some people thought I was dead. Uh, some people thought I moved away. So it was just a, a massive influx of like where it happened. So you've kind of, you know, really in the national media, this vaping. You back now. Um, the vaping um, uh, epidemic has really started to get into the news just in the last, like, I would say a few months. But you're starting to hear about people, you know, having in the hospital. I mean, it's really picked up its trajectory and what people are covering, right? 
So yeah. how do you kind of feel like now, like, oh, people are starting to get it. Like I've known this for a while. Like they've been yeah. enjoying my life. Yeah, exactly. It, it's definitely kind of like I told you some moment, um, but it's bittersweet. You know, I had my seizure a year ago and all these incidents and cases are popping up now. You know, they, they've been going on. Um, have the deaths necessarily been going on? No. Um, but it's very unfortunate and very sad to see that the media only covers this now that people are dying. Um, so it's definitely hard to watch, but it's bittersweet because things are starting to finally get done. Yeah, like as you talked about before this came on, we they were reporting on the news this morning that Walmart's going to stop selling it in Sam's. So I think what's really cool now is that you're going around and sharing your story across the country. You're leaving tomorrow yeah. for uh travel across the country to go talk to students. So talk to me a little bit about what you are trying to tell students and the message yeah. that you're trying to tell kids your age. So I, I obviously I want to tell the students that I relate to them being 16. Um, that's the biggest thing is that I'm still a student just like them. Um, you know, if I talk to a group of people and they can't relate to me, they're going to tune out. Um, but then afterwards, I, after I can relate to them, I always tell them about my whole history and my whole experience with vaping and tobacco products. And then afterwards, Vaping is, or addiction, just addiction in general, substance abuse addiction, is just a lot of shame, a lot of personal things going on, more than just a choice to choose or not to do. Mm -hmm. so I try and tell them some things that help out their mental, you know, tell them that they're not alone. Um, give them, try and have them think about their own values, because in no way possible can I make anybody do anything they don't want to do. You know, um, I always tell the kids, if I, if I told you to stand up and get me a water bottle, I don't want to go do that. Right. So, they try and get them to, to spark their own interest in themselves um, so they can figure out their own values, their own morals, figure out what's going on with themselves. But the, the last three messages I always film is you're going to take three things away. Um, first, take that you're not alone. You know, that's the biggest thing. Biggest thing just within humans, not even just in, in addiction, this is just in general, is that you're not alone. That's the biggest thing is I want them to know they have support and shoulder. Uh, the second thing is I tell them to take things day by day. You know, we get so caught up and so overwhelmed with the hyper focus we have on our future and the unknowns, which is scary because, you know, we can't control the future. So I just tell them to take things day by day, one day at a time, go by what you know, which is the present. Um, and the third thing I always tell them is that to accept and not approve. You know, you can accept your situation 24 7 and you will be able to grow. You deny your situation and you're going to be right back where you are. So in no way possible do you ever have to like your situation. Uh, no way possible do you have to agree with what you're going through. You just have to accept it. And how are you, because I remember I was like in ninth grade, right? And my girlfriend's mom, would, we, would we would take her, smoke cigarettes and relight yeah. them and take the end of the cigarettes, right? Because we were kids and we were like, whatever, we're going to try cigarettes. Now, you know, taking a cigarette and putting it in your mouth, because people don't want to see that. But the vaping, you can't see. They look like... Sometimes they look like hard jump drives. I mean, they yeah. think so easily hidden. But how can you get a kid to say, how can you reach a kid or a parent who's going to watch this with their kid today and say, dude, just do not even start? Because you're talking to teenagers. You're a teenager. If someone would have told you that two years ago, would you have listened? No. Absolutely not. I'll full on admit that is that two years ago, I was in a, a stage where I was not coherent to anything authority. So I didn't want to hear anything. Uh, I was, you know, I was a freshman. I thought I knew everything. I was, I was getting into high school. I was in middle school anymore. So I had this big, this big inflated ego. Um, that was just me personally. But if I were to say something to a teen, I just tell them there's healthy alternatives. You know, whether you're dealing with curiosity to fuel curiosity, spark curiosity, to relieve stress, to cope with stress, anger, anything you're going through. Um, it's a healthier alternative to do it than using a vape or a substance, drinking anything. It's a healthier alternative. Um, an alternative that you guys can use before, even if you're done with an addiction, is that everybody likes food. So I know that's one that people can use. Um, there's music, athletics, video games. Um, there's so many things that we can do as humans that we enjoy, especially as teenagers. So just figure out what you like. Constantly try new things. Um, it'll help you out in the long run. And if you were to tell your 14 year old self that was sitting at that football game and you could in any way explain to him, you're going to end up in rehab. Your grades are going to yeah. fall. Your life will be literally dedicated to nicotine. How yeah. you know, I mean, that's a big thing that happened to you. When you go to these schools, do these kids come up and say, 
man, I've been vaping. Like, do you think that's going to happen to me? Or what do kids say to you about vaping? Because the percentage of kids vaping right now is really Yeah. So a lot of kids tell me that they do it. Um, a lot of kids tell me that they quit. Um, and then a lot of kids who say that they haven't done it say that their friends do it or a family member does it. So in some way, everybody's been touched by vaping um, and just tobacco in general. So a lot of times they ask me how to quit. But the biggest thing they ask me is not how do I do this, it's just like what do I do after? You know, what do I do to relieve my stress? So it's just giving them that education of like here your alternatives. Mm -hmm. Right, because some people, when I was a kid and I smoked, I smoked for the taste. I didn't smoke yeah. for the, and some people smoke for that short buzz you get off of that cigarette or vaping. Yeah. So that's why you keep talking about the stress is that there is a buzz that happens because it's immediate, just like a cigarette, because it's yeah. aerosolizing that nicotine straight into your. Yeah, and you won't get that buzz forever. You know, your tolerance level gets up. So the more your tolerance level gets up, the less buzz you get. Which then just fuels your addiction. You go more and more. So um, I tell them that it's not going to last forever. That buzz isn't going to last forever. The device isn't going to last forever. Um, so if you're going to choose something that you have to change anyways, why don't you make it a healthy alternative? And weren't you at one point smoking the equivalent of like, was it 80s? I, I saw one of your talks. Yeah. Over. So I was smoking four jewel pods a day. Um, and for those that don't know, one jewel pod is equivalent to 20 cigarettes and nicotine. So do the math of four times 20, that's 80. So I was definitely pretty deep into it. And you are not only talking to schools, but you've been talking to, you've been to DC, correct? Tell me about that. Yeah. Uh, so I've been to DC, uh, New York, California, Minnesota. That's good in Montana. I've also been to South Carolina. Um, but I've definitely done some big work in DC. Uh, I had a meeting with the FDA, the CDC, um, other health officials, um, parents against vaping e-cigarettes, my mom. Um, campaign for tobacco free kids and truth initiative um, and also the u.s surgeon general so i've definitely done some work in dc um, and in north carolina my own state i've done a press conference with the nc state attorney general and these people are listening correct they want to hear from you i mean you spoke in front of the tobacco folks correct yeah absolutely um the goal is for them to listen so i hope they are um, yeah so if you have one thing if you were to sum up what vaping feels like and being addicted to it for parents and teens that are watching how would you describe what it feels like to have gone through this process to be addicted yeah. and to have tried this it's very lonely you know you're going through a lot of shame uh, each mistake you make you think that you're a mistake and the last thing you ever want to do to somebody is admit your insecurities and admit your weaknesses so you're very trapped and that's the biggest thing i can say is that you feel so trapped in your abilities so the more we shun somebody, the more we ostracize somebody, the more we make somebody feel bad for what they're going, going through, is the more that they're just going to continue to be addicted, um, the more that they're going to want to hide from you, isolate from you. So those words of encouragement, those accepting words of accepting mistakes and being just supportive in general and being a shoulder for them is what's been their biggest their biggest asset. Um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you taking the offer from a complete stranger to get on and talk on her platform that you never heard of. And um, I'm so happy for you that you got through this. It's a really tough age to go through this in your life, but the fact that you're telling your story and sharing your story, which is what we're all about, and creating change is just, it's awesome. Thank you so much. And I'm really, really proud to have met you and talked to you about this. And I know that your mom and I had talked about maybe if I could ask her a few questions about what it felt like on her end. Mm -hmm. So is it okay if we bring her in and I can yeah, ask her a couple can. questions? Yeah, we can do that. All right. Thank you so much, so, Luca. Yeah, thank you so much. Have a great time. Oh, this is Kelly. Hi, Kelly. Hello. She created a Facebook account just so we could do this. <laughs> <laughs> it's a step into the modern world. Step into the modern, modern world. Kelly, thank you so very much for um, allowing Luca to share his story. I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions, Kenna, because I know this is this had to have been an incredibly stressful time for you. When did you find out that his vaping had caused his decline in his lifestyle? It took some time, you know, a few weeks after he started before I put two and two together because it, even though his behavior changed rapidly, we didn't at first connect it with nicotine and then with Juul. Right. At first I thought oh, he woke up one day with psychiatric issues and then right. you know, 
after a few weeks, I realized that I thought it was nicotine withdrawals. And then slowly information started coming out about Juul and the massive dose of nicotine it delivered and the effects of it. And so I was able to put two and two together and go on from there. But Kelly, just to hear that um, it was a few weeks um, is uh, crazy. Like some people might be like, oh, my kid, try they're going to try vaping once or twice. I know I can't help that. But if, in a few weeks, he had completely changed. Oh, absolutely. And, and it was drastic. It, you know, when he talks about being irritable at home, that's an understatement. He was explosive to the point where he was kicking in the back door, taking our dishes and throwing them, destroying furniture, kicking in the side of my car. And it was usually over something as minor as you can't go out tonight because you have homework or why have you not done your homework? Or, and, you know, occasionally we'd find a tool and destroy it and that usually caused a huge explosion. Well, we've done stories um, on this platform on what's it feel like before about addiction, but I'm, I'm shocked to hear that that is the response that these kids are having to vaping withdrawals. I mean, that's the first I've heard of that. I'm no addiction expert, but that's, that's extreme. Well, and I don't think it was a withdrawals at first. I thought it was, but I think it's actually causing it. Causing I mean, it. Yeah. I think the massive dose of nicotine is, you know, causes impulse control, cognitive loss of function, ADHD symptoms. So, you know, and they knew that nicotine already caused that, you know, from cigarette smoking. Right. And so when you multiply that times a hundred, that's why we were seeing such huge drastic changes. When he had that grand mal seizure, which I know that the doctors have not, cannot definitively connect that to the nicotine, but he hasn't had one since, correct? That's correct. And he had no history of seizures. No history. What was that like for you? That had to have been a major turning point, or I don't know. Tell me what that was like for you. It was terrifying, obviously, you know, because we realized he could have died. And well, yeah, six minute grand mal seizure is. Exactly. Or, or he could have ended up with irreversible brain damage. Yes. So, I mean, but it was so frustrating because when we were at the ER, the doctors wouldn't test him for nicotine because at that point there was so little information out there about the jewel that, and they had never heard of it. So they, all they would say was that, well, this isn't consistent with nicotine use because they were thinking about like kids smoking right. cigarettes, kids mm -hmm. can't smoke that many cigarettes and they didn't realize, you know, what, what, what kids were doing. Right. So it, it was very frustrating because that's when, you know, we'd already been struggling with therapists and getting them to pay attention. But after this, then it flipped over to where the medical field, pediatrician, neurologist, cardiologist, they were being just as ineffective as the therapists. So it increased our frustration. Because this was about a year ago. It was about a little over a year ago when this was starting because he's been clean for almost a year. But this was before all these reports were coming out and people were going, huh, hmm. Right. I wonder if vaping has something to do with all these lung issues we're seeing and all these behavioral issues, correct? That's correct. You and know, so, go ahead. there were articles at that time about Juul, you know, and coming out more and more frequently, but none of them, well, very few were mentioning the behavioral changes. Okay. Parents were seeing, and parents were keeping it quiet too, because, you know, there was a sense of shame. And I've spoken with other parents who haven't told anyone, haven't told their families and friends. And, you know, when they read our story, it gives them some strength to say, yes, it's happening to us too. And um, that's what made us realize at first we thought we were the only ones, but after the article came out and we started getting contacted by parents all over the country, we realized it's happening everywhere. Cash, isn't it? crazy how powerful it is to share your story and not feel alone. My goodness. We talked about that on the phone yesterday. Um, we talk about the decision to put him in rehab and what that felt like for you. You had to send him to California for 40 days. Tell exactly. Me you and what that decision making process was like. It was hard. You know, I had been searching for local treatment and even outpatient treatment. I was looking for a therapist who specialized in adolescence and addiction and even though the one he had claimed to focus on adolescence and addiction, she still wouldn't consider nicotine addiction a problem. You know, when I told her what it was doing to him, she told me to back off that he needed Juul for his anxiety. 
And so then I would argue back and say, but he didn't have anxiety before he started juuling. Right. And so, you know, we went round and round. So that's where the frustration started in getting him treatment. So then I looked at youth focused programs and I called the insurance company. We spoke with his pediatrician and he didn't know what to do about it. And I don't think any of them did at that point. But I knew that Luca was acting like he had a substance abuse problem. So he needed to be treated as if he had a substance abuse. He didn't need a nicotine patch. He didn't need Nicorette gum. He needed to be forced to quit cold turkey. And I realized that if we did an outpatient local program, he would have then gone to school and jewel. So mm-hmm. wouldn't have gotten him off of it. He had no desire to quit. He didn't see a problem with what he was doing. And he had no intentions of ever quitting. So, you know, then we had to start searching all over for help. And the insurance company actually ended up being our friend in this battle. That's great. I I know. I called them and I told them that he had a substance abuse problem. I told them how he was acting and I told them the substance was Juul. And they agreed. And, you know, they tried to help me find local help, you know, throughout the state, the surrounding states. And they allowed me to expand my search. So that's how we ended up in California. And he did not want to go when you sent him. No, he did not go willingly. And we didn't tell him till the evening before we were leaving at three in the morning to go to the airport. And he was, you know, he threw some items around the house, destroyed some property, said he wasn't going. And I lied to him and he gives me a hard time about it. But I told him it would only be for about eight days that he needed to try it. And, you know, knowing full well that it was 35 to 45 days. Mm -hmm. So he found that out when he got out there that I had lied, but he does admit he, he wouldn't have gone otherwise. Right. I had to threaten to call the police and have them take him and put him on the plane. So that helped get him wow. to court. What advice, um, Kelly, we talk about this all the time. I mean, I was having this conversation with friends on a walk a few weeks ago about they all, they, you know, the people, the kids in the school know who the kid is that brings all the cartridges, the vaping cartridges. Um, I talked to somebody else just last night who, a bunch of kids in the school got in trouble because they all came out smelling like vanilla because a lot of these cartridges are a uh, flavor or they have um, sense to them. And so they all got in trouble collectively because his, uh, his son had gotten in trouble, you know, five months before that for vape for vaping. But what can you tell parents that are like, how, I guess what I'm saying is teenagers are going to be like, we know, we know, don't do this. It's dangerous. What advice can you give parents about things to watch for and things to say to their kids? Because your son was on a very, very bad path. And thank by the grace of God, he is okay. But what can you tell their parents? Um, We tried everything. We tried bribery, punishment, and we found that none of that worked. What he needed was support. Um, and, And I tell schools this as well. You know, if he had been suspended, it would have given him the opportunity to stay home and vape all day. Suspending kids isn't the answer either. They need some, they need resources and there aren't enough adolescent resources for any issue. And this (laughs) this made it very clear, this whole situation. So they need resources. They need to be, they need to be cut some slack. We put a lot of pressure on them. You know, you no longer, they no longer can take a regular or high school class. They have to take AB, IB, honors, you know, none of the regular classes are enough. So they have to take ninth grade math when they're in eighth grade and 10th grade math when they're in ninth grade. We need to slow down and stop pushing them to succeed so quickly. Take some of the pressure off them and, you know, give them a chance to stay kids. And if they try it and the parent finds out, do you, is it, would you say, what would you suggest that they handle that situation if they find out they've been vaping? Because I believe that you can do nicotine tests on kids now to see if it's in their system. Yes, we did that. <laughs> Just like you can do a drug test. How, <laughs> how, looking back, how would you have handled it differently if you had the chance? Or maybe you wouldn't have. Um, I would have, at first, you know, when I thought it was just, um, when he was vaping and I thought it wasn't as dangerous. Now that information is, you know, I realize it's not true, but the information's out there. So parents need to understand. Parents need to get educated about this because a lot of parents are saying, my child would never do that. And, you know, ever, I learned the hard way. Yes, your child, my child would do that, but never say that. Yeah. But, um, you know, I don't know what a parent can do besides just support their kid and have us 
have a conversation, non-judgmental conversation with them and explain to them the facts. They need to share Lucas' story or other stories from their peers. Yeah. Teens are wired to not listen to adults. So it's really hard to get through to them. Right. So, But Luca, after three weeks, his entire life completely changed after vaping. He dropped his, he started failing classes. He dropped out of sports. His complete behavior changed. And 15, 16 months later, after trying vaping, vaping, he ended up in rehab for 40 days after having a six minute grand mal seizure. That's his story. That's what parents need to hear. They need to hear that this is dangerous. And I think it's, it's sad, but it's helpful that, that it's being reported about what's going on right now with all the lung issues, the kids in ICU with their in medically induced comas and unfortunate passings of people. Right. I need to pay attention to that because it's dangerous. Yes. Well, I, um, I'm so um, inspired by the both of you for taking a really uh, personal and private and hard situation and sharing it with people because you're affecting every time he speaks in front of students and you speak to parents, making them change their thought process and maybe having a conversation they hadn't had before. And um, we have heard a lot of people saying, you need to talk about vaping on what's it feel like. And I kept being like, well, I don't want to just have a parent on there that's like, I'm scared. And then Lucas shows up that night on TV and I'm like, I'm going to find that kid and I'm going to talk to him because he seems great. <laughs> so thank you so much for allowing me to do that and for sharing your story too. Thank you so much. And I wish you all the best of luck on your trip tomorrow. Keep spreading the word and um, keep doing what you're doing, Kelly. It's awesome work. Thank you. Okay. Well, keep in touch. I want to keep posted okay. on that. All right. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Have a great trip. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.